let's face it, the holiday season is super busy. And if you're like me, you may find that you just don't have the time to meal plan during November and December. If you're looking for nutritious and convenient meals, try Factor. Factor is not TV dinners. Factor is chef prepared, dietitian approved, and ready to eat meals that will save you precious time and help you stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Now, with Factor, you can rest assured that you're making an environmentally friendly choice. Factor offsets 100% of their delivery emissions and they source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites. So skip that extra trip to the grocery store, skip that prepping, at least for the holiday season. Head to factormeals.com slash sustainable50 and use code sustainable50 to get 50% off. Sustainable50 at factormeals.com slash sustainable50 to get 50% off. Well, hello there, listeners, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 421 of Sustainable Minimalist. If you just found this show and you're thinking to yourself, what on earth do they talk about here? Well, we talk about intentional and eco-friendly living. Today's show is one of those bread and butter podcasts on the show where we're discussing decluttering and home maintenance. Specifically today, we are examining the ways in which our external lives, aka our homes, and our internal lives, aka our psychology, influence each other. Yes, holy moly, major topic. We're doing it today. My guest today has a very interesting background. Helen Sanderson is a professional organizer, yes, but she's also a psychotherapist. Helen believes that we can learn an awful lot about ourselves by taking a good hard look at the state of our living spaces. And that's whether you are a diehard minimalist or you are a less than tidy pack rat or somewhere in between the state of our homes have something to say about our mental and emotional well-being. Now, Helen and I are discussing some other hot-button topics in our conversation today, including the number one question I receive, which is, of course, how do we get our partner on board with minimalism? Helen's answer to that very important question may surprise you. Helen, I'm so thrilled to talk to you. How are you? Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here and really great to to speak to you as well. Well, first of all, I love your accent and I just love talking to people from across the pond. You sound so mature. Yeah, so English. (laughs) So refined is the word I'm looking for. You are so interesting to me because you're a psychotherapist and you're a professional organizer. It's two of my favorite worlds coming together. So tell me how you got here and what you do. How did I get here? My goodness, I've done more things than that. I was an interior designer as well. So it all knits together. Prior to that, when I'd been to art school and I was very interested in how when you go to a gallery, you transport yourself mentally into a painting, don't you? Sort of there's that imagination. But actually, I was interested in installations where you go into a space and the space kind of envelops you and you have an experience Ever since then, I've been really interested in how space affects your how you feel, your well-being, your mood. And so obviously, as interior design, we were all about creating moods and atmospheres and things. And then throughout all of that in the background, I've always been interested in psychology and personality types and things like that. So I've always been looking at clutter through the lens of psychology or psychotherapy in a way. Me too. I am not a psychotherapist, but I do have a master's degree in counseling psychology, which might be a surprise Mm. for my listeners. And so I'm always curious, is it the chicken or the egg? Does the clutter cause or does the messy space perhaps cause internal uh, storms or is it the internal storms that then create the cluttered home? My mom always told me growing up, messy bed, messy head. And so I guess my first question for you is, of course, what does clutter tell us about ourselves, our own mental and emotional well-being, perhaps? 
There's no one answer to that question, firstly. (laughs) I would say that obviously there's a lot of interest in ADHD and ADD at the moment. And I would say that probably about 70, 75% of my clients are on the spectrum somewhere. And so when you've got that kind of brain, it's very difficult to complete things and to, you you tend to be quite creative, open-minded, always onto lots of things quite fast. And then you leave a trail of stuff behind you. So the chores of keeping house, as it were, if they're not learned, and I do know people that were very fortunate that they learned those skills, it can lead to really a lot of problems in that area. So that's one aspect. However, there are a lot of cases, and I was talking to someone recently, actually, where trauma has resulted in clutter. I talk a lot about this in my book, The Secret Life of Clutter. But there's examples of people who have suffered a bereavement. And when that happens, you go into a state of survival, not thrival. And then all of those things around the house, they just become secondary. And and if it's a long period of time, it can accumulate. The other one is procrastination, just not wanting to do it because it's boring. I run a workshop where I try and help people understand. And quite often, if somebody's had the type of upbringing where their mum was saying, tidy your room or go to your room, or it was quite harsh, that can often invoke a rebel that is, I don't want to, I don't feel like it. And then that rebel then grows up into us. So we're a 50-year-old rebel still rebelling against mum in some way. So that's just an idea of a few types of reasons that I think that people that I've found. There's people that are very sentimental, they've suffered loss. Um, Objects have intrinsic meaning, they connect you to people, they connect you to memories. So it's very, I I find it really profound and, and immensely interesting. And there is a very mundane layer of clutter that it's just stuff. But there is also the very kind of um, profound meaning and the fact that every person's stuff is chosen by them and is an expression of their personality and their story in a way. Hmm. You mentioned there that, you know, if a parent kind of nags at their child to go clean up their room, the child may, not definitely, but may grow into a 50-year-old rebel who doesn't like cleaning their Mm -hmm. then homes. Mm -hmm. So what should I be saying to my nine-year-old pack rat who has a dirty (laughs) and disgusting room? I don't want her to turn into a 50-year-old rebel. I want her to... I want her to want to clean up her spaces. So any thoughts there? Yeah. Think of it as life skills. For kids, if you say go tidy your room, it's too general, isn't it? It's much easier for them if you can agree with them. Say, when I've done the laundry and I put things on your bed, I'd like you to put them away. And it's a very clear, specific instruction. Or I'll come and help you or teaching them how to do it or getting involved and and giving them those skills, especially if you've got a kid that is neurodiverse or on the spectrum, they're not going to be able to find their way unless you really coach them and guide them through it. I I would suggest if it becomes a big battle, it's best to avoid it because that's where the rebel is going to come up. And also teenagers need to have that little bit of rebellion, don't they, as well? So let it go maybe. as Yeah, let it be. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking about clutter. If So if one end of the spectrum that we're discussing today is clutter, the -hmm. other end of that spectrum would be extreme tidiness, extreme minimalism. I know that for me, I found minimalism, the other end of the spectrum, because I was a new mom and my life felt 100% out of control. And Mm -hmm. so holding on to a tidy home and having less stuff and decluttering. That was, and I didn't know this at the time, (laughs) but looking back now, I think my white knuckle grip to the minimalist lifestyle was due to the fact that I felt like I was living in a tornado and I wanted to hold on to something and I chose minimalism. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts there? Do you see the other end of the spectrum in your capacity as perhaps a psychotherapist or a professional organizer or both? You're absolutely right. It's a spectrum. It's a continuum, isn't it? So you've got hoarding at the one end and then OCD at the other end. And an OCD is generally quite often an anxiety condition. 
And it's also related to needing to feel in control. So the little parts that you can feel in control of, you're in control of. So you externalize a lack of internal control. So you externalize it and make that to feel like you can control your environment. And yes, I've come across people like that in psychotherapy, less so professional organizing, because generally people with OCD are generally pretty organized. But funnily enough, what's really interesting is that a lot of people with clutter are actually quite perfectionistic. And one of the reasons that they get stuck is because they want to do it perfectly. And so that then paralyzes them into not being able to get into action. So there is a lot of perfectionism, ironically, underneath the pile of clutter. Mm. I'm thinking about the people in my life who tend to hold on to stuff Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. decades And there definitely is a feeling of, I want to do right by this item or this box or this stuff. And they can't see that there's piles of boxes because they live in it. And so I really appreciate that point there. Mm. What would you say, though, to somebody listening right now who says, I'm just not a tidy person. I'm just not an organized person person. I hear that a lot. Again, in my own personal life, some people say, that's just not how I operate. I like a little bit of mess or a lot of mess. (laughs) Can they learn the skills they need, the life skills perhaps to tidy up? Or are there organized people and tidy people and people in the middle? I would say it probably is the latter. The only reason to try and change is if it's bugging your partner so much. And it's, or it's causing a lot of stress in your life. But sometimes to be able to learn something that is not your natural mission. So, for example, if you're not very good with numbers, you you give it to your accountant. Or if you're not very good with words, you might use a copy editor. And we're good at delegating that. But there's so much that you can delegate to your cleaner or your housekeeper, or if you can afford that, that there's so much that you maybe need to learn. There are definitely different personality types and different people that, have higher value. So some for some people, they have a high value of order and aesthetic. And if that's messed up by their partner or their kids, then it's unsettling. But there are other people that are just so much more relaxed. And like you say, they don't see it anymore and they just live with it. And who are we to impose what we think they should be doing? The only reason it it's when it becomes a problem, like I said, is if it becomes like a health and safety concern, a health concern, or it is something that is starting to bug you or upset you in some way, then you can definitely learn. I feel often feel like I'm a bit of a super nanny in the home. Like I'm teaching people how to do stuff around the house that they just never got modeled for them as kids, which is why when you talk about your kid, I just say model and make it into a teaching life skills kind of thing for her. I'm wondering, you mentioned the partner there. I think so many of us, we find ourselves in partnerships as adults in which we have a different view on maintaining a household than our partner. Do you ever work with couples who maybe one is a, I don't, I hate the term neat freak, but I'm going to use it. One's maybe a neat freak or neat freakish and the other one's more slovenly. Those are horrible words, but what I'm trying to say is they're on opposite ends of the spectrum we previously mentioned. I love that question because I believe that we all have both and that we just inhabit one of them. And then you find somebody that inhabits the disowned aspect of yourself. So if you're the neat freak, then you found a slob to be. And so it's trying to come together a bit more and learn to for the neat freak to learn to be a little bit more relaxed and the slob to be a little bit more kind of considerate and make a bit more effort. But in terms of working with couples, I've had lots of couples contact me and say, help, what can I do? But it really does require the other person, the person that is causing the stress to be willing to change and be willing to to make space in some way. And I think that quite often one of the solutions that we end up looking for is what area can you have complete ownership of? So if your house is completely chaotic and you're a person who needs order, can you have a room that is primarily yours where you can go and get your order, need for order and beauty met? It's a really tricky one, isn't it? Because there's 
complexities around relationships and dominant personalities. And I'm fortunate that my husband is is relatively tidy, but there's still things that get on my nerves as in any relationship. Yeah. What I hear you saying there is perhaps it's so much deeper than the stuff. (laughs) Like it's not the stuff. Perhaps it's are both people feeling heard in the partnership? Is there compromise in the partnership or does one person tend to get their way more often than the other? And I'm just thinking about compatibility uh, in general, not about stuff, not about minimalism, just in general. Mm -hmm. I do feel, and not maybe that opposites attract, but that opposites can definitely balance each other out somehow. I'm thinking about my boisterous, extroverted personality that actually pairs fairly well with my quieter and more introverted husband. And Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if you ever see success stories in which a super tidy person and a less tidy person can reach a middle ground with better communication. I wouldn't say that I've found success stories. I've met people that have managed to make it work. One particular client I'm thinking of had a very orderly house and she'd managed to contain her husband and his chaos in his room. And he had his domain to be chaotic in. He actually had the shed, obviously, the man shed and the room. So she was obviously running a family and bringing up kids and everything. And it was really imperative for her to have a sense of order And he was just not like that. And I found that really, actually really beautiful that he had his space where he could just be as messy as he wanted. There's another case of an artist that I knew once who was very meticulous in her living environment. And yet her studio was in her flat and in her studio, it was complete and utter chaos and mess. And I just thought, here's somebody who's managed to allow both of those aspects of herself to be expressed in such a beautiful way. But in terms of couples, I'm sure there's lots of couples that are managing to negotiate. And there's always, in any relationship, there's always going to be some bone of contention that the couple have to try and navigate and negotiate. So you might be compatible in the space that you live, but maybe you're not compatible in the holidays that you take or the type of holidays. And there'll always be something that requires some sort of negotiation. That's marriage, right? That's yes, marriage. exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, Helen, we need to take our ad break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you about your claim that a cluttered home is like an overgrown garden. I love the metaphor. We need to break it down. We're going to do that after a quick sponsor break. You trust your water filter pitcher to make your tap water safe to drink, but is it really doing anything? Most filters just can't remove gross contaminants like bacteria and parasites and PFAS and microplastics. I could go on and on. I trust my water filter pitcher for water that's safe for my family to drink, and if the brand I bought isn't doing what it advertised to do, that makes me feel so frustrated. Enter LifeStraw Home. LifeStraw Home is the kitchen upgrade you will wish you made years ago. It's the only water pitcher that filters out over 30 contaminants. It's made of glass, not plastic, and most importantly, for every pitcher sold, a child in need receives a year of safe water. Better filtration, better taste, better design. Use code SUSTAINABLE for 20% off your first purchase of any LifeStraw Home product at LifeStraw.com. Dot com cannot be combined with other offers. And we're back. Today I'm speaking with Helen Sanderson. She is a professional organizer. She is also a psychotherapist. What a combination. You can find her online at The Clutter Therapist. I'll link to all of her good stuff in this week's show notes. But Helen, you say that a cluttered home is like an overgrown garden. And I have an overgrown garden. (laughs) So I want you to tell me all about it. Take it away. Okay. The reason I use the garden metaphor is because I don't know if you've ever met somebody that says, uh, we haven't got a garden, it's too much work. So we ha- we know that gardens are a lot of work, but for some reason, we don't think that homes are a lot of work. 
But actually the reality is, especially if you've got kids, you can tidy up and in 10 minutes, the place is completely chaotic. So, you know, if you've got shopping coming in, there's stuff coming in, there's stuff going out, there's growth and there's movement in the home as much as there is in a garden. So when I talk about the garden metaphor, if you've got a big overgrown garden, the first thing you have to do is you need to go in and start doing the weeding. So that is basically looking for the weeds. So it's rather than the Marie Kondo method, which is looking for what I love, it's looking for what can go, what I can do without. Because ultimately, if weeds have overgrown, they've overgrown and probably killed all the beautiful plants that are in the garden, which means that all of the beautiful objects and things that you have, you can't really see them anymore because there's too much stuff around them. So if you do a weeding process, and the weeding process, I say, is the decision-making process. So clutter is decisions that haven't been made and actions that haven't been taken. So you go through the garden and you make the decisions about the weeds. And then the once you've cleared that all out, the second part of the process is to do your planting plan. And the planting plan is deciding where things are going to live. So everything has a place for everything. And that's where your design, aesthetics aspect really comes into four. And once you've created your order and everything's got a place, then what you need to do, like every garden, if you don't maintain it, it's going to grow back to weeds. So you need to do your maintenance. So so that's a three-step process. Weeding, which is decisions, clearing out, planting, which is finding homes for things, and then maintaining, which is da- the daily chores, the habits, the daily grind. Yes, I'm nodding my head because I'm thinking about how perfect your metaphor is. It's it is on point. And as you're talking, I'm also thinking about a metaphor that makes sense for me. By the way, if Helen, I have to tell you, yes. I <laughs> I relate everything to exercise and I don't know why I do this. But taking your metaphor and applying it to exercise, getting in shape or getting your house in shape is yeah. so much harder when you're not in shape yeah. and maintaining your health, maintaining your being in shape, maintenance is much easier than getting to that place in which maintenance is uh, a daily thing. I- I'm not sure if that makes sense, but yeah. it's much harder to start from a place of disarray, a- an overgrown garden, a yeah. cluttered home, a overweight and zero muscle mass physique, perhaps. My question here, and I do have a question, is if you're starting from that place of we need to clear out the weeds, we need to have a baseline amount of fitness before we move into the maintenance phase, that takes a lot of effort, energy, drive. What are your best tips for listeners who are struggling with the motivation? Um struggling with motivation you can imagine can't you? you're standing right now in front of a garden you can't even see the back fence because it's just completely overgrown and you can see why that's overwhelming and I've walked into people's houses and they've said look this is my spare room or this is my garage and it's full of boxes this high that is overwhelming it's true but if you've got somebody that can support you with a system and break it down step by step I use um, a bit metaphor over, (laughs) I love your exercise metaphor, but I use one of climbing up a mountain. So if you're going up Mount Everest or somewhere, you just focus on getting to base camp one. Because if you focused on the top, you just won't do the journey. So you you just focus, take it out piece by piece and chunk by chunk or pie by pie, whatever. And so that's really people who are very stuck, overwhelmed in freeze mode, or procrastination need just need a buddy really. And I think that's why professional organizing is very popular and it works in the same way that if you use your exercise metaphor, having a personal trainer, if they're standing right there, you're going to do those press ups, but if they're not, you're probably just going to talk yourself out of it and go and bake a cake and eat a cake or something. (laughs) But it is exactly what you're saying. When you're starting from that place of being behind, I talk about it in my book, living with clutter is like living in debt. You've got to clear yesterday's stuff to get up to now, which is then when you can do your daily maintenance, which is exactly what you're saying. And clearing debt does require a lot of effort and energy and focus. And it can be disheartening and it can be 
It can be hard. It's a hard journey. That's okay. We can do hard stuff, can't we? We can do hard stuff. And I just want to say for anybody who's struggling with the motivation part, yes, clearing out an overgrown garden, clearing out an overcluttered house, losing 10, 20, 50 pounds, erasing the 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 or more credit card debt. Yes, that's all super hard. Mm -hmm. However, once it's done, living in maintenance phase in the maintenance phase is so much easier. (laughs) So don't think that if you start, it's going to be a hard slog forever. The hard slog is only in the getting to baseline, I would say. Do you have any thoughts there? No, I just totally agree. And I think that's where if you are losing energy and motivation, then that's when you want to get your support team. If you're climbing up Mount Everest, don't you have a support team? So get your support team in place. And I always say the more stuff you've got, the more stuff you've got to manage clear the debt, you'll feel so much better, you'll feel so much lighter. And there will be that, like every process, you start off with enthusiasm and motivation, and then you're going to hit that place that's either boredom, lack of self-belief, lack of belief in another, whatever it is, you're going to hit that wall. And that's where you need to really call in your support and you can just apply what I call perspiration to get to that end bit it's a journey, isn't it? But the self-esteem that you will give yourself from actually doing that journey, sometimes losing all of that weight or clearing off that debt is actually the journey in and of itself is so rewarding and such an achievement. Yeah. It shows you who you are deep down. Yeah. I think yeah. it's the best yeah. way to say that. And so I just want to piggyback, I should say, off the metaphors that are just yeah. flowing in our conversation. Oh, I know. So many metaphors, so little time, but you did write to me and you did say that our homes are like our flight decks, Mm -hmm. a flight deck in in an airplane, let's say. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about that? And specifically, perhaps you can tailor your response to those listeners who might be feeling like they need to get to work in their own home. I think that your home is like a battery charger, a place where you go home and you recharge. And if it's chaotic, it's going to stress you out. So you're not really going to be able to recharge. The reason I call it your flight deck is I think it's your base camp where you're running your life from. So you're making plans for the future. You're saving money. You're investing in your kids. You're bringing up your kids. You're learning. Whatever it is you're doing, you're nurturing yourself. You're feeding yourself. You're having fun, hopefully. But it's the place that you're running your life from. So why would you get on an airplane with somebody who wasn't in charge of that flight tech, you would feel really unsafe. So it's like a gift to yourself to give yourself the gift of an organized flight deck, really, so that you can run your life from it. Because life, I don't know about anyone else, but it's flying by really fast. And so when you're in chaos and you can't quite manage those things, it makes it that much harder. So really just want to encourage people to reach out for help And there are lots of people that help and lots of stories in my book about people that have overcome really quite adverse situations. I'm definitely going to link to your book in the show notes, but just one final question here. You mentioned getting help if you need it and no shame in the getting help game. However, I'm sure I have listeners who are hearing our chat today and they're saying getting help costs money. (laughs) Do you have any thoughts there? Like, is it only the people with money burning holes in their pockets that can get help? Or I'm thinking about asking a friend, getting an accountability buddy. Like, what other options are there for people who need help but can't afford to hire that professional organizer? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I did set up a Facebook group, actually, in the hope that people could find a buddy. So it's not big enough to be worldwide yet. But one of the things that when you're faced with that garden and if you don't know what's a weed and what's not a weed, then it's going to be more difficult. So if you've got a little guidebook of the, this is generally the weeds and these are not, then it makes it that much easier. So I put together my home declutter kit 
which is my method that I use. And that basically gives people a, a guidebook of how to do it. And you and the best way to use that kit is with a friend. It's not expensive. So two people, one person making the decisions, you need to be the decision maker. And then having an assistant doesn't have to be an expensive professional organizer. It can be one of your kids earning pocket money, bringing you stuff so that you can make decisions and helping you put things away. Just It's just about bringing some flow back into a very static, heavy environment. And it can be fun too. So definitely get a friend, get a buddy, do a swap with somebody, be accountable. Yes. And I love that we're talking, Helen, in December, perhaps January 1st, new year, new you, new home. Perhaps yep. that's when you start. So what a conversation today. I really enjoyed talking to you so much. Thank you. <laughs> tell my listeners where they can find, and again, I'll link to it all in the show notes, but just tell us where we can find you online. You can find me online at helensanderson.com and on social media, The Clutter Therapist. And my book is The Secret Life of Clutter. And there's lots of not only the the stories, the book's very easy to read. It's lots of stories, but there's lots of resources that you can link to and they're all free. So once you've got the book and there's lots of exercises to get you motivated and get you going. So do tap into that. Hmm. Helen, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Again, you've taught me an awful lot and I enjoyed every second of talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Listeners, that's a wrap. My friends, show notes are at mamaminimalist.com forward slash 421. And after speaking to Helen, I had some thoughts. (laughs) It's a shock to no one, right? That we are smack dab in the middle of the holiday shopping craze. I am putting the finishing touches on this episode on Cyber Monday. And so I personally am just being inundated with the ads and the sales and the enticements to buy stuff. And let's, of course, be real. How many of us are buying stuff for ourselves during the holidays? Oh, we see a deal on this quick little thing we were spying. Let's just pick it up for ourselves. No big deal. But if we are to apply the metaphors that Helen so aptly discussed today, if your garden is overgrown, should we really be buying more weeds to add to the problem? Or if our flight deck is so cluttered already that it's hard to see the controls to adequately fly the plane? Is it in our own best interest to add more items to the flight deck? Just some food for thought. Now, before we say goodbye, if you don't know, now you know, this podcast is a small business. And so if you receive benefit from the show and you want to support it without spending a single dollar, you can do so by simply leaving this show a quick rating and or review on your favorite podcast player. Apple Podcasts is the big one. Spotify is another. But if you listen on another podcast player that allows for ratings or reviews, leaving one would really make me smile and help the podcast grow. So thank you for considering it. On Thursday's episode, we are discussing my favorite beverage. (laughs) Yep, we are. We're discussing wine. It's my favorite, and I'm not even sorry about it. How can we purchase wine like a conscious consumer Everything you need to know about wine, everything you need to know about the environmental aspect as it relates to wine, we're discussing absolutely every single thing you need to know so that next time you go to buy wine, you can do so as an informed consumer. So I'll see you on Thursday. As always, you know how to find me. I'll see you Thursday and take care.